I didn't understand the reaction that Shenmue 3 had when it was announced at E3 in 2015. I mean, I was vaguely familiar with the Shenmue series. I knew it was a revenge story that took place in 1980s Japan, and that its plethora of mini-games and deep attention to detail were tied together by an open world that begged to be thoroughly explored. I knew it was one of the most popular games on the Dreamcast, a console that I never really had growing up, and I only got to experience it much later in life. And I knew that the people who love Shenmue, really love Shenmue. To the point where even someone like me who's never been exposed to the game was at least somewhat aware of what it is and what it does. But I still couldn't quite grasp why, when the third installment was announced, why I saw footage of games journalists losing their minds in a passionate frenzy and a live audience erupt into a blaring roar. I've seen videos that have tried to make sense of its Kickstarter campaign and I've found websites refer to Shenmue 3 as one of the most fan requested games in history. But what the hell was so special about this game? Well, with Shenmue 3 on the horizon and Sega's efforts to make good on their promise to bring a large portion of their library over to the PC, I guess I'd finally have my answer. Shenmue 1 and 2, a remaster of the first two Shenmue games by D3T, was the perfect place for me to jump into this decades-old series and discover how an action-adventure life simulation game from 1998 could cause such a tizzy all these years later. And you know what? I think I get it. I honestly think I understand why Shenmue is so beloved. It's an amalgamation of all these things done that's so different compared to its contemporaries that it stands out as an experience unlike anything else, in both a good and a bad way. It seems like Shenmue is a game that takes two steps forward and one step back constantly, but somehow manages to string together all these ideas in such a cohesive manner, it offers a truly memorable experience. One that stands out beyond merely being a product of its time and offers something that's so wholly consuming. Right off the bat, Shenmue really tries to show off its maturity. Not necessarily in an ESRB sort of way, but in its presentation and its themes. Yeah, it's a basic revenge tale wherein the protagonist, Ryo Hazuki, embarks on an investigation trying to uncover the whereabouts of his father's murderer, Lan Di, and the secret of the artifact that he stole from his family. But beyond the simple setup, Shenmue attempts to separate itself from its contemporaries in pretty much every conceivable way, and it really tries to explore the depth of video games as a narrative medium. For one, look at how Shenmue looks and remember that for 1998, this was cutting edge stuff. There were few, if any, games that could compare with the amount of detail that Shenmue had, both in the sense of its graphical fidelity, but also in the amount of stuff that the game has in it. Sure, it's been eclipsed by other games like Yakuza, which pushed the envelope even further than Shenmue ever did. But for its time, Shenmue's attempts to present an open world with a great amount of detail help solidify that this sort of fantasy is a living, breathing world, something that we didn't really see in video games up until that point. Even now, Shenmue offers a deeply immersive experience that takes the player out of the real world and brings them into this virtual world that isn't all that dissimilar from the one that they themselves are familiar with in real life. You see shops roll up their shutters and open for business in the morning, buses run on set timetables, and bars become busy social hubs at night. People follow daily routines and items are meticulously placed all over the game's world. And the game's characters, most of which are extremely memorable in their own way, Yo, bro! I've got you a job, man! Help drive home the sense that Shenmue's world is a living organism. I remember. Time is always ticking in the background of the game, unless the game is paused, and the feeling of a daily routine quickly sets in. And it's through that sense of routine, of the mundanity of everyday life, of finding things to do to pass the time and trying to get as much done in a single day as you can, that makes games like Shenmue so special and memorable. See, this is what I mean when I call it mature. It takes the concepts of interactivity inherent to a video game and uses it to offer an experience that, again, especially during that time, was unlike any other. It really tried to push the boundaries of what video games could do in terms of storytelling, and that's what really sets it apart from its peers. Indigo Gaming made a fantastic video exploring why mundane activities in games like Shenmue and Deadly Premonition and Alan Wake can lend themselves to creating much more immersive and memorable experiences than other video games. And his video casts a far greater light on the subject than I could ever hope to. I highly recommend you watch it. But suffice to say, when Shenmue creates a living world that feels authentic, I think it truly succeeds in this manner. It's a sight to behold, especially when one considers the technical limitations at the time, 
and what exactly a game was supposed to be. But Shenmue isn't all sunshine and roses. I know I just spent a lot of time praising how well Shenmue managed to buck the trends of certain video games from back in the day and offer a wholly new ordeal to gamers, but by that same token, Shenmue's a victim of its own time period. It hasn't aged gracefully at all. While I hold that the game still looks fine given its age, it would be disingenuous of me to say that it still truly looks good to this day. This isn't something exclusive to Shenmue. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that Shenmue is actually one of the few games that manages to overcome the growing pains of early 3D graphics. You see, as a rule, 3D graphics tend to age poorly as technology advances, in contrast to older 2D games whose style and picture-perfect compositions manage to hold as time passes. So while Shenmue manages to still look good, all things considered, it still suffers from blurry textures and stiff facial animations, despite being held up by what is a pretty solid remastering job. On the other hand, the game's audio does not share the same fate. It is simply awful. In conjunction with some pretty dreadful English voice acting... What are you, some kind of TV detective or something? Yeah, I'm always grooving, man! If I move, more customers may come! You've got yourself a good friend there. Uh-huh! But we're good friends, too. I see. I'm happy for you. It sounds way too tinny due to the fact that the files are highly compressed. Which makes sense given the fact that every single line of dialogue in this game is voiced. And given the fact that physical media only has so much space for storage, compromises needed to be made. Ergo, the audio compression. But we're living in an age where such things aren't considerations anymore, right? So why does this remaster still have such crappy audio? Well, allegedly, Sega lost the master copy of Shenmue some time back, which means that the audio was taken from the Dreamcast version of the game that shipped out. I mean, it's not so bad that it makes the game unbearable to listen to, you do get used to it eventually, but it's very hard not to notice it, and I'm not even an audiophile. Fortunately, these issues don't extend to the game's score, which is quite lovely and I think is absolutely great! Various melodic tunes and Japanese-inspired ambience tracks flesh out the game's locales, from seedy jazz tones and bars to heavy plucked bass during your general back-and-forth investigations. It's actually akin to something you'd see out of like a Hong Kong action movie, and they do really well to enhance the sections of the detective work in the game. Never mind the fact that it has one of my favorite theme songs for a video game to date. As far as the game's controls go, the easiest way to describe them is a bit archaic. Ryo doesn't control the most elegantly. Instead, moving around feels very clumsy and awkward, both during the combat sections and in the general overworld. Ryo tends to take these wide turns quite often, and the sluggish camera controls make it way too easy to steer him into a wall. The camera feels stiff, and it feels like it moves really slowly even though it really doesn't, but Ryo's movements feel floaty and they lack pretty much any sense of friction. It's a really weird combination, but it just doesn't feel very smooth to play. And the way the buttons are mapped to the controller really gives away the game's age as something that came out before controller standardization. Not that it's a problem, but it's something that you can immediately tell. That combined with a lack of any sort of easy to access minimap and makes actually moving around the world a bit more of a pain than it ought to be. Don't get me wrong, the layout of Shenmue's game world isn't difficult to navigate given its constrained size, and the game does have these little maps that you can interact with and they'll give you city districts, no problem. But considering that there are locations that you need to go to that aren't even listed on these maps that you can interact with, it makes it easy to get lost in the early portions of the game. On the flip side of that, however, combat feels pretty tight and responsive. Ryo has a plethora of moves and combos at his disposal that aren't too tricky to pull off, and there's even a hotkey assignment available for one of Ryo's moves, making a particular complex attack mere button press away. This all makes sense, especially considering that Shenmue's combat is based on Virtua Fighter, and apparently Shenmue was even slated to be a Virtua Fighter RPG once upon a time. But despite having a solid fighting game engine behind it, the fighting in Shenmue... kinda sucks. This is partially due to that aforementioned camera sluggishness from before, but it's also because of the fact that Shenmue uses a 3D plane for its combat. You see, 
Virtua Fighter wasn't built for group encounters. It's a solid 3D fighter, but all of its encounters are one-on-one -on -one in nature. In Shenmue, almost all of the fights are against groups of enemies. More often than not, I found focusing on the one guy who I wanted to engage with was problematic, and as a result, the combat devolved more into button mashing and spamming a few combos that I memorized rather than a satisfying martial arts encounter. Honestly, the camera is going to be your fiercest opponent. And the only exception to the game's controls were the fork driving sections, because they actually handled surprisingly well. There's not much to say here other than they're functional, but it's worth mentioning that this section of the game really stands out as a memorable experience by itself, going back to my whole point of how mundanity brings about some of the most memorable experiences. It's so simple and straightforward in a very relaxing Euro Truck Simulator 2 sort of way. It's just a shame that by the time you reach this section, you're forced into it at the expense of the rest of the game. By the time you're regularly spending time at the harbor, the game pretty much railroads you into following sequences of events precisely, and it takes away that open world that up until now you've spent more or less freely exploring at your leisure. There were way too many times I was ready to head back into Yokosuka and take care of some loose ends, but I was turned around because Ryo kept saying, I've got plenty of time to ask around without much of an indicator as to what precisely I had to do before the game would let me leave the harbor. Sure, you have a handy notebook that keeps track of plot objectives as they unfold, but that's not quite the same as having to see a random scene before you're allowed to leave an area. The nondescript nature of the objectives is a bit of a running theme, but the harbor is especially bad. Like, I get that these are pretty important story hooks, but at the same time, some level of descriptive prodding would be nice. Especially since a lot of these sort of scenes are interactions that are time sensitive. Because you're a constant slave to the clock, being mindful of timing is pretty critical to Shenmue. And that's perhaps because Shenmue isn't the simulationist paradise that I perhaps really wanted it to be. It's a static cage that requires a checklist of items to be completed in a particular order, oftentimes at the expense of giving the player total free reign over the environment. There are arcade games to play and capsule toys to collect, but these are cheap and simple ways to be able to kill time until the game decides to let you progress. Nothing makes that more evident than the game's failure states. QTEs and free battles are simply redone over and over again until you win without any additional penalties put onto the player. I'm not expecting a branching story with different outcomes and diverging plot points necessarily, but it feels a bit anticlimactic to be given the illusion of alternate outcomes only to be set down a linear path. But then again, that linear path is compelling enough to have kept me hooked for the 18 or so hours I put into finishing it. And I really, really wanted to finish this game. I really wanted to know how it ended. It had its hooks into me hard. As I said before, Shenmue's hook about a boy trying to get revenge for his father's killer is fairly bog standard. But that narrative is made special precisely because it includes those cheap and simple time killers that are used to pace out the game's narrative. Shenmue is, by all accounts, an adventure game first and foremost. It's a game that knows it has a story to deliver, and it makes no qualms about making the player follow that story. I think that the biggest mistake a newcomer to Shenmue can make is to assume that it's a wide open sandbox a la Yakuza, because it really, really isn't. It's not looking to be a massive time sink as much as it's looking to poignantly deliver an experience that feels more akin to what you'd expect out of a film than a video game. And that's the part that changes it from a straightforward, banal experience into something that's truly captivating. And I think that, right there, that's the Shenmue that fans of the series remember. And that's why they flipped out when they found out the series would continue into a third game. If a 7 or 8 year old me had played Shenmue back in the day, I really don't think I would have appreciated it just as much as I did playing it now for the first time. And that's because that 7 or 8 year old me would have been far more focused on slick gameplay and cheap quick thrills at the expense of slow gameplay that rewards stopping and taking in the scenery. But I can only imagine for those who did appreciate the game, to see it come back now and offer a glimmer of hope to see an epic and winding tale come closer to its conclusion, they would be awash in feelings of satisfaction and excitement. And that's the E3 reaction that I didn't understand when I saw Shenmue 3's announcement without having played the game myself. But now that I've played it, I've got to say that I like Shenmue quite a bit. It's a good game, a revolutionary one even. If there was ever a game that deserves to be called cinematic for the right reasons, it's Shenmue. It's not quite a game, but rather an experience unto itself, and I know that sounds very pretentious to say, but I have not played a game that resonated with me the same way Shenmue has. 
It's like watching a film, really. And I know that's a cliche, but you can tell that the game's focus was on delivering a tightly knit story above all else. Gameplay is secondary here, and that's what can be so off-putting to some people. It was one of the most expensive video games ever developed back in its heyday, with an estimated production and marketing cost of between 47 to 70 million USD. And you can see why that's the case throughout its entire run. Much of the development has gone to great lengths in order to make the world of Shenmue feel lived in, delivering as authentic of an interactive experience as it can by dragging the entire medium of video games beyond being simply toys or things of entertainment for kids, but for attempting to present it as a mature medium for storytelling. And now that I've played Shenmue, I can see why this game is so highly regarded. It was ahead of its time graphically, narratively, and even through its gameplay, though perhaps not as you would expect. While it hasn't aged well, I think that its faults can easily be overlooked because of just how acutely it tries to be different, and how it succeeds in being different. Shenmue stands out as an experience unto itself, and it's absolutely worth playing today, just so long as you're the type of player that's patient and values a strong focus on narrative and emotional storytelling over player expression and slick gameplay. So, do you know where I can find some sailors? Sailors? Yeah, I do! They hang out at bars! They always start street fights when they're drunk, you know! <laughs> <laughs>